Hi, I'm Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. just for you. We look at life through a biblical lens and solve all the world's problems in two hours or less. This week in the news, actually in the last several weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about how the Quran and the Bible, especially the Old Testament, are the same. They teach the same kinds of principles. You Christians, you, you, you have it all wrong. Well, there is a difference. Uh, you know, we look at the, what we consider to be the barbaric customs uh, under Islam. They will tell us that the Quran governs these things, tells them that they're supposed to do this stuff. Uh, some of that's true. I guess most of it would be. Some of it's not. It's not like that. But we are listening to these folks and we're thinking Western. They're Eastern. We're thinking Western. In our Western civilization, we have books. One of them is called a Bible. And the Bible has 66 separate books, things that have been written specifically. And with a, one or two exceptions, we know exactly who it was that wrote it. We know when it was written. And we can follow the path of that copying down through the generations and know that we have today everything they knew 2,000 years ago. I don't have time to go into all that. <laughs> We've talked about it before. You'll have to check through the videos and see if you can find it. But here we have folks trying to blend these two things, trying to, to fit these together. With the Quran, the Quran was a verbal testimony for years. Supposedly, Muhammad gave these messages. If you read a Quran, they're listed as surahs. They're in stories. And they're, some of them are named after animals. It just says the cow, you know, or something of that nature. And they seem to be sort of rambling stories about who knows what, but embedded in there are a phrase or a sentence, something that gives an instruction on, on some form of behavior. We're not sure where this came from, except that tradition has it that Muhammad heard this in a cave, and it scared him out of his mind. But he would go back to the cave, and he'd get more information. Muhammad could not read or write, so he didn't. He passed it along verbally. Well, over time, somebody wanted to write these things down, and they found that the oral history was locked into a, these clans, different families, different groups who had memorized different sections. So they sat down, they did all this. Well, it turns out that one group had, I think, five chapters or five something more than the other group. And the debate was whether we're going to include them in. And some Qurans don't have it and some do. And I guess you could say this is the problem with almost any of the ancient writings, uh, that you would not be sure. But with our Bible, God put in a little phrase in the early part of Genesis. Archaeologists know it as a teledot. And you've read it if you've read the Old Testament account in Genesis beginning with Genesis chapter 1. Because the Teledoths end somewhere around chapter 15 or thereabouts. But it gives you a picture into the society. What happened? Well, what happened is what happens in a lot of societies. As the patriarch is passing from the scene, he leaves what he knows to the, to the succeeding generation. To the, to the next generation. And you read about it in the Bible initially with God, but then with Adam. And it says Adam lived so many years and died. But in the course of that, he'll say, Adam lived, he had these wives or this wife, these children, they had this, we did the... These, these are the, can't think of the word now. I didn't write it down. 
Uh, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, but that phrase repeats itself 8, 10, 12 times in the Bible. Historians, archaeologists came around later in the 1800s and found out that's a teledoth. That's when he recorded his life. And then it went to Seth. And then it went down, down the, uh, the path. Abraham, you have these teledoths. The, these are the generations of. That's the phrase. Well, we can track that up until a point where people actually have written documents. That documents were then translated and moved along. We have a copy of the book of Isaiah in a museum in Israel that reads word for word the way yours does in your Bible. And it was written 200 years before Christ. That's a tremendous heritage. And it bears witness to the fact that they were keeping track. Well, anyway, we have these messages, and they are somewhat suspect in the Quran because of the way they were recorded. But we, we recognize this is what they understand to be their Bible. They're now telling us there's no real difference between what the Bible requires, and I'm assuming this is Old Testament law, and what the Quran requires. We, in the West, detest the idea that they would stone a woman for a sexual sin. But the Old Testament law required that as well. We reject the idea that to be a Muslim, you must do all that Islam requires or be put to death. Well, the Old Testament law required those who refused to live according to the principles contained in that law were to be banished from the community. And if it were bad enough, they could be stoned as well. And there were a multitude of everyday rules, and many of these were unyielding. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that there were civil laws in the Old Testament, which governed the nation of, nation of Israel, encompassing not just the behaviors, but it also specified the punishments for particular crimes. There were ceremonial laws about what is clean and what is unclean, about various kinds of sacrifices and other temple practices. And then there were moral laws, which declared what God deemed right and wrong. And we have the Ten Commandments, for example. Thou shalt not. Ten times. For the Old Testament Jews, back Old Testament Israel, all three types of these laws blended together. You broke a civil or a ceremonial law, it was a moral problem. Conversely, breaking a moral law had a civil and often ceremonial consequence. But they only went hand in hand because Israel was in a unique place historically as both a nation and a worshiping community. The difference is the Old Testament law was given by God through Moses to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, and not to Gentiles. These laws were not binding on all man. They were only binding on Israel. Why? Well, in part because Israel said, that's what we want. Under Moses, when he presented the law, he read it to them. And they said, we, we will live by it. We want to be governed by this. It isn't imposed upon them. They could have said no. And none of these laws are binding on Christians. And certainly not on, on pagans of any sort. They serve as types, they serve as principles, but they don't have a legal significance in the Christian's life because Christianity is not a legal system. Christianity is a faith system. 
Today, there are more and more people and groups telling us how we need to obey certain of the Mosaic uh, laws. WorldNetDaily.com uh, has a regular feature with a preacher teaching this very thing, and now his son is doing it. A key difference between Sharia and Mosaic law is that the Mosaic laws were rehearsed in the hearing of that nation with the question, will you commit yourself to this law? The nation of the people said yes. So now we have a covenant between God and his chosen people. It's not a legal system imposed on anyone who lives in Israel or among the Jews or in whatever city that may be. Also, the penalties imposed by this law are adjudicated by a duly recognized legal entity requiring at least two witnesses, ideally three. And the witnesses had to have seen the crime firsthand, not just seen the result of the crime or heard about it. They had to have seen it. They had to have seen the other witnesses seeing it. And they had to have tried to stop it. That's a pretty high standard. And there were crimes worthy of stoning. Deuteronomy chapter 21 specifies a stubborn or rebellious son, one who will not obey his father nor listen to his mother's voice. There must be proof. It isn't that one time he just didn't listen. It has to be a pattern. It has to be demonstrated in the community that this child is incorrigible. In Leviticus 24, one that blasphemes the name of the Lord, again, with proof. Levit Leviticus 20:13, homosexuality, with proof, witnesses. John chapter 8, Jesus pointed to adultery, with proof, not just because the woman's pregnant. Jesus reminded the people that Moses had given Israel an out when it came to adultery. History assumes that these old guys were killing off their wives so they could marry a young chippy. God never let them out, but Moses did. Moses said you could give them a writ of divorce if she's guilty of adultery, rather than stone them. We saw that with Joseph and Mary. When it was discovered that Mary was pregnant, Joseph was going to go to the elders, and he was going to give her a writ of divorcement. He didn't want to stone her. And the angel of the Lord said, don't do that. Moses gave this out to protect women. Jesus called this kind of behavior hardness of heart, and he indicated it was not what the law required. The writ of divorcement was an accommodation because men's hearts were evil and hard. Now, the similarity between the Old Testament law and the Sharia law stops with the definition of law. Under Sharia law, a woman may be bitten, be, be, beaten, stoned, or beheaded for simply appearing in public not fully covered, for being seen talking to a man, not her husband, for being raped, for being abused by a man, not her husband, by being around a man in such a way that it embarrasses or diminishes her husband. And he can do any of this without trial and without appeal. A person may have his hand cut off for stealing. Not the hand that took it, but a particular hand, the right hand. The right hand was for eating, so now this person has to eat with their left hand. But the left hand in, it, in this culture was for cleansing oneself after going to the bathroom. 
That is a double punishment. A person may be disfigured for a crime. And these punishments may be handed out by men in the privacy of their own homes, unknown to anyone else. Why? Inshallah. It's God's will. None of these unilateral punishments are permitted under Mosaic law. But even if they were, Old Testament was only for Jews. Old Testament law was only for Jews that volunteered to be held accountable to it. Jews who were a special people of God a family of mankind from which would come the Savior of the world, a family that must be kept pure and holy to protect the lineage and to guard God's testimony in the world. Jews could walk away if they chose to do so. Jews who were honored to be a part of this group willingly submitted to this law. There were Jews who had been born into it. And technically, that's how you get to be a Jew. It's not just somebody who walks up and is ready to say five rules out loud. Well, Jews will take in Gentiles under certain circumstances, but they'll make you a Jew in the process. And you are giving in to this law. It's a lengthy and arduous process. You have to learn the laws. You know, every Jewish, it used to be male, now the girls, uh, they have to repeat large sections of the Old Testament from memory. Learn the laws, learn the scriptures, learn all about the feasts and what that's about. They then have to be baptized. Jesus was baptized. John was baptizing Jews. What was he doing that for? Same reason that a Gentile would be baptized by a Jew. It's a cleansing ceremony. In John the baptizer's case, it was Jews who had rebelled or ignored the law, had become very liberal and and secular in their approach, and they didn't want it that way. And under John's teaching, they wanted to do right, and they were being ceremonially cleansed to go back to where they belonged. Jesus didn't need that, but he said, John, I have to do this. He was identifying with these people, and all of this was for a genuine purpose, that this family would become a people of God forever. Israel exists as a people of God to fulfill God's promise of the seed of the woman that would crush Satan's head, Genesis 3. The early, gen- early genealogies bear witness, as do the written records of Judaism. When Jesus was born, his lineage on both sides, on Mary, his mother's side, and on Joseph, his stepfather's side, were traceable back to Adam, one through David and the other not. This could only happen in a very tightly woven culture. His coming to die to fulfill the law of God was as a sinless lamb slaughtered for the people's sin. He was slaughtered on the afternoon before Passover when the Passover paschal lamb was slaughtered. He was our Passover. In fulfilling that prophecy, the law was done away with. No longer is fellowship blessing with God, for God, of God, limited to the Jew under law. Now it's for all men by God's grace, through faith in what Jesus did, not what I can do. Christians are to keep themselves morally and spiritually clean. Christians are to be holy as God is holy in all their behaviors. Christians are motivated toward this by God's indwelling spirit. Christians are empowered to accomplish this by God's indwelling spirit. Philippians 2.13 Christians do not need law. They pursue holiness 
because that's what God has made them to be and that's what they want to maintain. When you read a report, as we saw this week in ChristianHeadlines.com about cohabitation rising among Christian couples, you must be immediately suspicious. Christian couples do not want to cohabit. Well, humanly they do. But spiritually, the Bible says they have a desire in them to not do it. It is the God which is in you now, both the will and to do according to his good plan. They have a want to that's going in an entirely different direction. Will they be sexually active? Could be. Could it reach an epidemic proportion? Not likely. Not unless the churches are either teaching it's okay or they're studiously avoiding any teachings on it at all. But regardless of what the churches do, a true Christian will know it's not right. Paul said in Romans 14, verse 23, whatsoever is not of, is not of faith. You can't do it in a clear conscience. If you can't do it as unto God, then it's sin. 